Warning, this podcast contains heavy spoilers for not just one movie, but entire franchises. We highly recommend going and watching these movies before listening to us as a companion piece that stitches all the timelines into one creepy, crime-ridden story. There will be no more spoiler warnings. We do not break character. After this, there is no turning back. You've been warned. Hit the music. (laughs) You are talking about the nonsensical ravings of a lunatic mind. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Welcome to It's Alive Alive Podcast. This is a true crime paranormal interest in a podcast covering unbelievable stories that sound like they were ripped straight from the pages of a Hollywood script. I'm your host, the man of many names, the outlaw Harley Ray, the bruiser Bronson, Dr. H.R. Smokenstein, T.H.C. or you can call me Josh for short. And with me as always is my very own Scream Queen, the perfect combination of beauty and brains, the brightest, most the Indian, the hired expert, the guts and gore, the gorgeous, the sexy Amy Rose. Hi. Right. We're in a bit of a panic today, aren't we? We're in a bit of a rush. We're a little late, so we're going to jump. Right the fuck into this. Right, year two, let's go. So in promoting this week's show, I've been saying we are going back to where it all started as we return to the world of the ghost face killers. And while we kind of are going back with the moniker, we're actually staying well away from the original tale as none of these stories take place in, around, or to anybody from Woodsboro. So no Prescott's or Loomis is creeping around this week, although we will be going back to that story eventually. Obviously, it's no secret that there was another string of murders in Woodsboro and in New York in the past two years. Yeah, it's crazy. I know we're waiting to cover it so that we have all the information, but I read Gail Weather's latest book, Requel, Terror Returns to Woodsboro. And with that and all the media around the New York murders, I have a little bit of a rundown on what happened. It seems as if a horror movie nerd by the name of Richie Kirsch discovered that OG killer Billy Loomis had a secret child in Woodsboro. The girl, Samantha Carpenter, was bought up by another man who believes she was his biological daughter. Now, when I say he was a horror movie nerd, I mean he was obsessive. With his main obsession being the Woodsboro-inspired Stab franchise, like the rest of us. But I think that's just because... uh, Stab started to come out when we were kids. I was like nine when the first one came out. So it was my first proper movie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was the first one I saw. First slasher. Yeah, I can't think of any proper horror though I saw before it. It was almost like you were kind of dared to do it at that stage, you know? Yeah. Because all your other friends are watching. It's like, well, I have it. You're going to watch it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, essentially so far it it seems like his motive was to create more source material for the franchise as he felt it had gone stale since having made a move to complete fiction so using the information he had on samantha he and his online girlfriend and woodsboro native amber freeman weaved their own little movie script which they hoped would someday be adapted for the big screen now amber freeman seems to be the one to give him the information about samantha Again, I'm not going to dig too deep into it because we're going to do full episodes on it. But uh, she was friends with uh, that family. So I'm assuming she found out and fed him the information. Okay. Needless to say, they were not successful. And these two wannabe Tarantinos met the same end as all the others who tried before them. This led to the family of Richie Kirsch to seek revenge on his killer Samantha, her younger half-sister Tara, and her friends, twins Chad and Mindy Meeks. And they were the nephew and niece of Randy Meeks, and he was a suspect for a short time in the first case with Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker, and was eventually murdered by Nancy Loomis in the first copycat attacks in Ohio. The Kirsch family story is still a murky one, very fresh, so I don't really know a lot about it just yet. But I'm told that they have an evil lair full of old evidence from old ghost face crimes. The father was a cop, so I don't know how he still managed to get that out of there, though. I'd assume at some point someone will be like, oh, this was brush, it's going missing. <laughs> Uh, together the family killed I think it was 10, 5 in Woodsboro and 5 in New York and again just like all the others that have worn the screaming mask before them they were killed in action as they attempted to get revenge just as Nancy Loomis had done over a quarter of a century beforehand. 
Again, we will do a deep dive on the Curse family and the Loomis connection eventually, maybe for our next anniversary. But for now, I just wanted to acknowledge the crimes that have taken place and kind of set the tone. Because just like Richie, a lot of these crimes are inspired more by the Stab franchise than the actual real-life events that inspired them. And um, by that I mean it's horror nerds like us watching the movies and using them as blueprints and not true crime nerds like us reading about the real events and copying them. Mm. Uh, also, I'd like to point out that in most cases here, the people don't claim to be inspired to kill by the movies, but more using the movie plot as a means to execute something they would have ended up doing anyway. So we have maybe five or six cases here. We'll see how many we can get through. Some with more coverage than others. So we start with a moderate one, and that's the murder of Alison Cambier by Thierry J- uh, Jaradin. I was saying his name all fancy all week. I was like, oh, well, it's French, so it's like Jaradin. And I went around Jaradin, and then I looked up some more uh, videos to get some more background on this person, and then Jaradin. Jared. Jared. Not the French for <laughs> So it's got a fair few articles about it, but apparently it doesn't warrant its own Wikipedia page, so I'll give you what I could get on it. The best I could find was from an article on theguardian.com, which was published around the time of the sentencing. So an American judge once described Stab, the ironic cult horror film, as a very good source to learn how to kill someone. Now, the film has spawned yet another copycat killing, one so cold-blooded it has shocked a local community in French-speaking Belgium. I wonder why he felt it was ironic. Is that a misprint by the the, the, the article, that it should have been iconic? Possibly. I don't know. Possibly. I don't know how it's ironic. Oh, well, um, unless it's the whole meta thing that they do in those movies. Could be. In the movie based on real life events, the Sleepy Hollow, or Sleepy Hollow, Sleepy American Town of Woods. <laughs> They'd Park. have serious troubles if they had both Ghostface and the Headless Horseman flying Can around the imagine? fucking place. Showdown. Uh, the Sleepy American Town of Woodsboro is terrorized by a slasher who wears a black tunic from head to toe and a ghoulish mask inspired by Edvard Munch's the painting, The Scream. The film and its sequels have attracted a cult following and a fancy dress shop's now stock replicas of the mask and robe. Unfortunately, the films have also inspired a spate of copycat killings and attacks, usually by impressionable American teenagers. And French, by the song. And things. French. It's, all these stories are American or French. Uh, French speaking or American. So your sources, how are they telling you to say her name? Cambier, is it? Cam- yeah, Cambier. Cambier. The film obviously struck a chord also with lonely Belgian lorry driver Thierry Jardin, 24, who chose 15-year-old schoolgirl Alison Cam- Cambier as his victim. Did I get that right? Yeah. She dropped by Jardin's house a few doors away from her in the town of Jarpin to exchange some videotapes and have a chat. Jardin made amorous advances towards her, but when they were rejected, his retribution was brutal. Excusing himself for a few seconds, he stepped into an adjacent room where his stab replica costume was waiting, together with two enormous kitchen knives. Clamping his hand over Alison's mouth to muffle her screams, he stabbed her 30 times, ripping open her left side. He then lowered her blood-soaked corpse onto his bed, slipped a rose into one of her hands and telephoned his father and a colleague to confess. He later told police that his crime had been premeditated and had been motivated by the cinematic trilogy. Alison's family and the people of Jarpines are now in a state of shock. Alison was a dazzling, young, affectionate teenager who should have celebrated her 16th birthday on the 16th of November, said one neighbour. Her family has also been distressed by allegations that she was in love with Thierry. Alison was not in love with her killer, Jean-Jacques Cambier, her father told or her father told the daily newspaper Le Dernier Her. People are misinterpreting facts and talking to me about a love affair which never existed. There was nothing in Jardin's background to suggest that he was capable of committing such a terrible crime. He had no criminal record or history of psychiatric problems. That's not completely true. I looked it up, right? So there's a bit more to all this than what's written there. Mm-hmm. It, it's all there, but you need to flesh it out a little bit. Apparently, they were friends, which is strange. A 24-year-old hanging out with a 15-year-old yeah. girl. But they lived two doors apart. He regularly swapped tapes with her. And apparently, they used to watch movies together. He had a bit of a strained upbringing. His mother was an alcoholic who left him. And his father was left in charge of him. And his father stuck around for a few years before he skipped out on him as well and left him with his grandmother who was in her 80s mm. to, to bring him up. Now, obviously, by the time this happens, he's 24. He must be living on his own because he rings his father first. So there's obviously a connection there oh, at yeah. some point. But, um, yeah, he didn't have the best upbringing. And it said that people knew 
he was a lonely, lonely man and a clingy man. Okay. He was known for being clingy. Now, cops found afterwards a diary that he had written. Mm. So he had been keeping tabs on this. And this is how they know it was premeditated. Outside the fact that they found receipts for the ghost face costume he bought and the knives he bought. Yeah. Which is crazy. Why do you keep receipts for that? Like, that that always you. just went... I was like, any time I'm watching a cop show and it's like, we have receipts for the weapon. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? You you destroy the weapon or you dump the weapon, but you kept the receipts. When they talk about receipts, do they not go to the shop and get the receipts? Do they have to sign something? Well, this sounds like they, they, they got it from his, oh, house, his house. It was on a, oh. in a search because they found a lot of horror movies, obviously. Mm. But um, apparently they used to watch movies regularly enough and in his head, they were already going out. Oh. Um, but to her, they, they obviously, they were just friends. And on this night in particular, he had planned to tell her that he loved her like, and he wanted to be with her and make it official. Mm. Uh, so he asked her to come over, telling her he had new tapes. And she came over and he brought her into this small room where he kept these tapes and told her, oh, look, I'm crazy about you. I want to go out with you and all this kind of stuff. And um, she said, no, she wanted to stay friends, obviously, because you're 24 and she's 15. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, he had it planned that if she said no, she well, he was going to kill her. That was in his diary. That he was he going to do it either the, way. The thing with the roses. Yeah. He had that to give to her if she said yes. And then he had the scream costume or the stab costume, the screaming costume, the Edward Munch costume inside in the room with two knives. And when she said, and the reason behind that was, see, this is where you kind of, he, he claimed this is a, a stab movie murder. Mm. But he claims that he only wore the costume to disassociate him from the crime in her eyes. So why do it? Basically, what he thought was, number one, she wasn't afraid. Because she thought it was a joke. Mm. Because they had watched the movie together. Mm. So she thought he was only playing. And he runs over and puts his hand over her mouth and just starts stabbing. So yeah, they said that she died instantly. He stabbed her like 30 times. Um, He put the rose in her hand then since obviously he wasn't giving it to Taylor. But he claimed that the idea was he'd wear the costume and it would disassociate him from it. She wouldn't be thinking of him when he was doing the crime. She'd be thinking of... Stab and ghost face. Yeah. So that was his reason for doing it. And, I, and you can't really say it's to do with the movie because this guy stopped instantly. As he soon as he did it, he done. rang and confessed. Yeah. You know, yeah. he confessed to his father, he confessed to a friend, and then he went to the friend's house. And the, um, her parents started to go look for her kid, you know, because mm-hmm. their kid, because it was getting late and he last she, they knew he was, she was going into this older man's house. Yeah. Uh, he had music on, and I don't get this completely music and a blue light flashing in his bedroom where she was and he, he was supposed to be a reference to the first stab movie nope. is it the party at the end was there a blue light there at some stage i can't remember the blue light and what else music what kind of music i didn't specify you know? um but yeah uh, so i don't know and um, they found there uh, the cops oh they did the ambulance wouldn't go in at first why? Because they couldn't prove that there were the criminals weren't still in the area. So oh. the cops had to come first. And once Shit. the cops come, then they'd come and they tried to give her... Well, no, she was dead at that point. Mm. Um, yeah, and they, they found him at his friend's house. He instantly admitted to everything. They said that he's very timid, very gentle, introverted at times, but was very willing to give everything up. And, uh, yeah, they just put him in jail forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that's about it with him. That's a bit fucked up. Uh, I'll take the next one with the murder of Gina Castillo. The source for this one is mamamia.com.au. I was listening to a video about this as well. And the dude was English. Mm. And it, I almost thought it was AI at one point, to be honest with you. But uh, when he got to these names like Castillo, he, he was really giving it Italian. socks on me. I, oh, <laughs> Castillo. <laughs> like, he was getting well into it. Uh, he didn't really tell me much more than I already knew, but I saw pictures of these kids. Okay. In 1998, Mario Padilla used three knives to stab his mother, Gina Castillo, to death in their California home. The 16-year-old had enlisted the help of cousin Samuel Ramirez, 15, who held her down during the attack. Now, I saw that Samuel Ramirez was actually four and that's why he couldn't be tried as an adult. adult, adult. adult. Um, and I'm telling you now, this kid, Mario Padilla, if you can see a picture of him, whew, that kid is dead incorporated. They're, they're, yeah. you know, oh, you look at his eyes are fucking, he's scary. 
funny skin on. For a little kid, you know he, he, <laughs> he will kill again. <laughs> <laughs> According to CBS News, the boys told investigators they intended to use money Castillo had been saving for her baby daughter to fund a killing spree inspired by Stab and Stab 2. The money was from a baptism, from a christening. Uh, that she had gotten for the baby. They planned to purchase Ghostface costumes and an electronic voice modulator at, and had selected five victims. The first, a classmate that bore resemblance to Stab star Heather Graham. There, uh, his father was also on the list, but he wasn't home at the time when they killed the mother. Uh, he got done for conspiracy to attempt murder as well because of this. Because oh. they had the list. So okay. he got he got done for everyone on that list as well. Okay. After the media began reporting on the cases of the stab movie murders and the debate flared about the impact of violent films on children, the presiding judge banned any reference to the films in the courtroom, declaring that it should be heard as a regular murder case. Both boys were convicted in separate trials. Padilla was sentenced to life in prison for murder and conspiracy to commit murder with no possibility of parole. His cousin was sentenced to 25 to life. They are both still inside in jail. Oh, Obviously, yeah. Padilla didn't go nowhere. No. And did you look up a picture of him? Yeah. yeah. He needs to stay in jail, right? Oh, that's some scowl. And that's a, that's a fucking 16-year-old, mm-hmm. you know? And yeah. those eyes, when you look at the eyes, they're, they're predator eyes. Like, Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, during the case, Madeline Levine, a psychologist who had been studying the effects of violence on children, told CBS there were a whole bunch of reasons why they acted out that way. But did the movie provide a blueprint? Absolutely. You need a cat to copy, and in this case, Stab is that cat. Another thing, do you feel bad for the little cousin? Because you think the cousin was just led along by the psychopath? Oh, I'd say so. And yeah. Now he's fucked, like, he's in jail kind of all thing. your yeah. life, like, yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, because at this stage, what what year was this? This was what did I say nineteen ninety eight. They're still in jail. How long have they been in jail? Ninety eight, two hundred eighteen, twenty six years. Yeah. So really, the cousin could get parole at some point. What is he? Twenty five to life. He's only a year over over mm, minimum. So it's hard to find any real information on it. These articles are very small. I mean, the next one I couldn't find shit on. Mm. nothing and this seems pretty do you know the one that we're going to talk about after that the one about the English kid yeah yeah fuck all fuck all and that's a mental one like you know so common trade here so far is the feeling that while horror movies don't create serial killers they might inspire a buttering killer uh, searching for an MO actually there's one more here essentially the same thing so we're going to get into that one but I will make the point of yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer liked horror movies, but he was obsessed with Star Wars too. So I mean, it's not just the movie. You can't really, yeah, he did they're not going build to do it either right away. And yeah. I mean, is the alternative if we get rid of horror movies that they just all start watching action movies and we just have more shootings, more mass shootings, more bombings, Possibly. stuff like that? Because Possibly. they're going to, they're, they're, it's hardwired there already to copy. So yeah. they're going to if they if it's a case of the the slasher movies are giving them an mo. Are the uh, John McClane movies or, or <laughs> fucking Richard Branson movies or whatever? Are they, they all gonna and go waiting for a terrorist attack in a skyscraper? <laughs> there is a mass killer around <laughs> the air ducts in a big tower. Somebody setting people <laughs> taking out security riddles at a fountain. <laughs> Yippee ki <Kaye>, motherfucker! <laughs> anyway, we're going to get into this one. This is Alice uh, Beaupere. Yeah, I think. I'm Beaupere? not good at French. Beaupere is what I'd say. Beaupere. 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 Well, I'm going to go with that. Sounds easier than what I was saying. And this again comes from mamamia.com.au. You can't say Mamma Mia any other way. In 2002, a French teenager identified only as Julian was sentenced to 22 years in prison for murdering his 15-year-old neighbor, Alice Beaupere. 15 years seems to be the common age here. Yeah. You watch those movies. They were all at least 17, you psychos. Maybe it's got something to do with hormones. Well, no, 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 no. The guy's doing it they're or older. Like, it's the fucking poor uh, victims that are 15. Oh, I just, yeah. No, you're right. Yeah, the girl's getting killed at 15. <laughs> the court heard that Julian's 17, that could have been hormones, <laughs> had watched the stab <laughs> films over and over in the lead up to this crime and had told a classmate he wanted to see what it was like to kill someone, according to the Times. Uh, that is always a red flag. <laughs> that June, he lured Alice out for a walk in their town of St. Sebastian sur Loire. Loire. After they went for to a cafe for a soft drink, they strolled through a nearby square. It was there that Julian stabbed her 42 times. He wore a ghost face mask during the attack. The in pro- the square? 
Huh? In the square. <coughs> yeah, this was outside. Oh. The prosecution said while the crime was not caused by the film, it provided Julian with the elements necessary to stage the murder. So, again. A bit I brazen, know. isn't it? Huh? A bit brazen. That's a lot of times for somebody to get stabbed in a square in public. Yeah. Without anybody doing anything. I mean, anything. like, I can kind of understand one stab like but. This is a small place. Because I think I did pull up some sort of a video on this and it didn't look to be a very big area. I've heard of it. Let me have a look. So that's I'm not bastions. too sure. But it's just, like, it's, that's a frightening concept, though, isn't it? That mm. someone, because we're going to talk about a group later on, two guys later on, and the way they talked about their friends before they went to murder their friends. And this is the kind of same thing. This girl is obviously walking around with a fella that she is friendly with. Quite possibly, 17, 15, maybe they could have been getting romantically involved, but this guy just... God. It's a nice place. It's bigger than here. Well, I think it's a commune. It's a commune? Hmm? It says that it's a commune. French commune. Does that mean? I have no idea. Huh. Anyway, not a whole pile on that one. Just a guy got 22 years. That was in 2002. Oh, he he's out this year, is he? He is? Definitely has out. Be. Well, he has to be. He was oh, sentenced to years. 22 yeah. years. If 22 he's not years. out already, he's going to be out guaranteed this year. Mm. So, yeah, unless he committed more crimes inside, in which case. Yeah. A little bit longer. I have to look up her to see if there's any information on Okay, I'm going to keep going here. So who's up next? I have one here, and it's not a murder, but an attempted murder, and it has a bit of a sad end. Unlike the rest of the feel-good stories we've covered today. Yeah. So <laughs> this is from an article on the Examiner Live.co.uk website in the Yorkshire Live section. Daniel Gill, 14, and Robert Fuller, 15, were sentenced at Hull Crown Court after being found guilty of the attempted murder of Ashley Murray, despite the pair denying attempted murder. Do you know, there might be something to this 18 certificate that they're putting on the movies. Yep. <laughs> they were given six years detention for attempted murder. The attackers, Daniel Gill and Robert Fuller, then aged 14 and 15, lured Murray to an isolated spot in a nearby nature reserve where they stabbed him 18 times using a screwdriver and a knife. 11 of those stab wounds were to his head. How do you fucking survive that? Because you've already said it's an attempted murder charge they were done on it. Bonkers. Yeah. How I many? No I'd idea. like to know how many of that. Oh, 11 of them to the head. Mm-hmm. Fucking hell. Where do you stab someone 11 times without destroying their brain? I would assume maybe they weren't getting past. The knife had to be small. Oh, yeah, yeah. Would the screwdriver the, get like, past like uh, bone in your uh, skull? Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know. See, temper, temper, yes. ear, ear, brain, 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 People eyes. have survived worse to the house. I mean, unless they were repeatedly stabbing him in the moat. Like, I can't, I just can't see how this works. Ears. A dog walker found Murray 40 hours later wrapped in a garbage bag, but still alive. Fucking hell. A court heard the boys had watched Stab in the hours before the attack and one had sketches of the ghost face mask and knives in his school notebook. Judge Arthur Myerson QC accepted that the two boys had behavioural difficulties which enabled convicted Harrogate drug dealer Paul Orans to exercise undue influence over them. Their exposure to the film which they had watched at Orans' home and to drugs, knives and black magic combined to blur the line between fantasy and reality for the two boys. The jury also heard Orans had given Gil drugs and by exposing him to black magic had convinced him that the gods wanted Ashley to die. Orans, who appeared as a witness at the trial, denied any involvement, but conceded he provided an unhealthy atmosphere at his home. Judge Arthur Myerson QC described Fuller and Gill as a serious risk to the public, and they said that they would have faced ten year sentences of 10 years or more if they had been adults. The judge also allowed the boys to be named, saying it was in the public interest. Murray spent nine months in hospital as he underwent multiple operations in his fight to recover. Fucking hell, nine months Mm -hmm. in hospital, fuck. But despite surviving this traumatic near-death experience taken out by his gullible friends, it was actually his Porsche that killed him. In 2012, after recovering from being stabbed 18 times and left for dead, Ashley Murray tragically died when a Porsche he was driving hit a tree. He was aged just 27 when he died. Now, it doesn't say in this article, but another article I read said that he was driving drunk. Right, I haven't heard of Paul Orange of the Paul Paul Orange guy. Like he's not a big drug dealer or anything like that. All I could find on him was from a dodgy looking website called UKdatabase.org, and they say he's a big old pedo. Like I say, this is not a very reputable looking website, but I'll read out what it says anyway. Okay. 
Drug dealer and paedophile Paul Orange rented a £49 a week flat from the Housing Association. There, all three boys were introduced to drugs, drink, gay sex and the occult. Orange, a bisexual loner who is not, has not worked full-time for years since the breakup of his marriage, uh, was, a well known, was well known to police, befriended boys, all pupils of Rosette High School two summers ago. Inside his darkened lair, candles illuminated an eerie black and white decor and the paraphernalia of the black arts. A gruesome ox's skull adorned the wall. A Ouija board and, a board and tarot cards were always available, as were cannabis, amphetamines, and cocaine. The CD first floor flat quickly became an oasis of anarchy for bored children who could pop in and on the way to school, just 200 yards away, and listen to Oren's palm reading and and his warped advice on how to interpret the Bible, all to the soundtrack of relentless dance music. I can tell Such you. Such an odd combination. Honest to God, well, yeah, I don't know about the Bible part, but I, I can tell you now, I know for a fact, because we, our schools were near, not rough, well, there was rough ish states close to them, both primary and secondary, mm. and I know there were certain guys who would drop into people like this, like, just smoke weed or whatever before work, or school and stuff like that, and after school, and, uh, yeah, now this is, this is not new, this is not, I don't know, this happens in every fucking town, but, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. But there are people like this. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But yeah, I can imagine it. Especially, you can imagine when he's talking about this, that he is extremely out of his head on cocaine. Because with the music pounding, you could guarantee that's cocaine. And he's just there talking about God, man. (laughs) It's just mixing dance music into all that is a weird mix. It's not instantly what I think, though. I've seen guys on cocaine. They're just talking, 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 while the music is blasting over them yeah so you can't really hear them you just see their mouth moving like a million miles per hour and the music's popping and you're just like i wish i was anywhere fucking else uh so gail and fuller get drawn in by this guy they're from a disadvantaged area and fuller in particular had a tough enough early life with his father abandoning the family so this is another common trait Mm -hmm. parents not being good parents and fucking off uh, by his early teens, Fuller was quick to temper and known to police. He was convicted of breaking into a pub in an attempt to steal alcohol and of vandalizing a car. Unruly at school, he was twice suspended. He began seeing a psychiatrist and admitted he suffered from violent fits or epis, as he called them. Now, I was asking this last day, what the fuck is an epi? And you had an answer for it. Uh, so it's trying to fit. Yeah. Uh, when I throw an epi, I start punching and fighting, he said. I can't stop. It builds up inside me and I've just got to get it out. A hundred yards from Fuller's house is the smart, semi-detached home of Daniel Gill. Gill, the son of 47-year-old car sales executive Jonathan and 46-year-old housewife Allison, has two brothers. And until he began secondary school, was a bright, undemonstrative child who had been marked, earmarked for A-levels. Now, again, I said this to you last year when we were looking over this. Undemonstrative just seems like the nicest way of calling him bland. And, yeah. <laughs> he was always reading books and was very quiet. He was one of the swats, recalled a former school friend. But when he moved to senior school, he changed. He began hanging around with Robert Fuller and getting into fights in the playground. Another friend added he always wore his this vacant look. I think his mother and father began to despair of him. He never seemed able to concentrate. Now, again, another trait here seems to be that quiet kid who is seen maybe like Swati usually. Those kids were kind of, it's not like they had huge friend groups. And then you have one guy who is angry and lashing out and they kind of attach to each other. Because I think they even said this about Columbine. Mm. They were the same there. One of them was crazier than the other. Mm. And the other one just needed a friend and was willing to do whatever the other friend asked yeah. him to do, you know? Yeah. And kind of go along with it. So I wonder, is this a similar situation here? It's like what I said about the cousins earlier on. Oh, yeah. The weak or quieter cousin, you know, being led along by the what we see as fucking... The Antichrist, Amy, and he's here. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The boys soon became part of what was known as a youth club gang. (laughs) That's the lamest gang I've ever heard of. Children agreed to tell their parents they were going to the local youth club, but pooled their money to pay for cigarettes and strong cider, usually bought by Orange. One of the former friends said they would sit around drinking, and it was obvious that both Fuller and Gil were taking drugs. (sighs) Say no to drugs, kids. Uh, they would burn out bins, knock road signs, road signs over, and set pieces of paper on fire. The 
queens. Caleb began telling friends he could hear voices and see little green and red men. That'd be the drugs. Yep. He was also seeing a child psychiatrist at the same time as the little green men. And <laughs> Although he was never convicted of anything, police sources hinted that he was well known to officers. By the time the pair encountered Ashley Murray at Rosette, their decent or their descent, their descent into delinquency, their descent into delinquency was in full swing. I, that, that sounds like a line from a proper true crime documentary. Yep. By yep. the time the pair encountered Ashley Murray at Rosette, their descent into delinquency was in full swing. Cheesy dark. Aided inevitably by Orans, they began making trips to a Harrogate shop called Way of the Warrior, on a, an Aladdin's cave of knives, air rifles, and martial arts equipment. One schoolgirl told how the pair began regularly carrying lethal lock knives. They would regularly brandish the blades to impress watching friends and chase girls with them. See, it shows how young these people are as well. Oh, yeah, chased no the girls concept. with him. <laughs> After the stabbing, police recovered three knives from Gill's house alone. The couple's victim is also the son of a motor trade executive, uh, Alan Murray, and his wife, Joanne, a marketing director. Ashley had a nomadic start to life. The only child, an only child, by the age of 11, he had moved several times and ended up in a large, detached house in Harrogate, only for his parents to split in 1997. Emotionally battered and coming from a broken home, Ashley fell in with Fuller and Gill, who ruthlessly exploited him for money and cigarettes. And being that we were talking about this between us the last day, in the 90s, there wasn't as many divorces, especially in Ireland, it was new. Mm, yeah. Oh, so if you had divorced parents, you were getting special privileges. Mm hmm. You were able to do what you wanted. You could say what you wanted. They were the kids that smoked. They were the kids with all the cool stuff. They had double Christmas and all that kind of crap. These days, now everybody and their, you know, everybody's got a, an extra mom and dad lying around the place, yep. you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there's more divorces than there are fucking people staying together. Yeah. So you, you'd have to wonder these days, it's like, oh, I'm rebelling because my parents broke up. And they're like, so is everybody else that. in the estate. Get the fuck over <laughs> it, you know? Yeah. Uh, Orange conceded he had given all three of the boys cannabis, amphetamines, and what he thought were hallucinatory magic mushrooms. If they weren't what he thought were hallucinatory, then it were was uh, poisonous. poisonous. <laughs> One boy he befriended committed suicide by throwing himself off a viaduct because he ate the poisonous ones and they hurt his tummy so bad he just couldn't live. Or Orange, they poisoned him and Orange threw him over. Possibly. Did anybody do a toxicology test on this kid? Orange's defense was simple. I was off my head in drugs. Good defense. Orange was sentenced to five years in prison for supplying drugs. His brother Mark from Ripon said last night drugs ruined him, but those boys knew what they were doing. Paul was good to children and would never have gotten them involved in any stabbing. Just drugs. Mm -hmm. A police source appeared to agree those boys were prepared to take the witness stand and lie about each other. Had Orange really been influencing them, surely they would have mentioned his name. But last night, the mother of a local 12-year-old gave an insight to Orange's methods of ensnaring young boys. He would even buy them Christmas presents to try and get them in. Now, before I move on to this bit about what he was like, I will say if they're both young kids, uh, young boys, uh, young teenagers, mm -hmm. and Orange is Orange is this big, scary, black magic guy over them, influencing them. Chances are they probably aren't going to rat him in prison because they don't want to be fucking they'd be killed. Of him. Yeah, they'd be afraid of him, <laughs> yeah. you know. Anyway, to get the kids in, apparently, he would buy them Christmas presents. He was polite but persistent and was always asking if the boys wanted to come around to his flat. Once he told the, this woman to play a scary film on the video and let her son watch it, at 10.30 there was a knock on their door and there was Paul dressed in a stab mask and black cape and holding a dagger. My lad screamed and was chased back up the stairs by Paul. After that, I wouldn't let my boy play with him. Shouldn't be letting your kid play with a fucking... No. Whatever age this old fella is anyway. What age is I say Too old for them. Does it say what age he is? Um, he is... He's 40... Oh, no, no, that's his parents. <laughs> <laughs> Point like, is, he's old enough to have been married once. Yes. And these guys are in their fucking mid-teens. So, two, two more. Yeah, 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 you're bad parents. One of them was 12. Huh? One of them is 12. That's not even mid-teens. That's a teenager. Well, I mean, you have to be a bad parent. You know the, your kids are going to this mm -hmm. place. You know what's going on. Yeah. Especially if you're all in a tight-knit estate... People know what's going on in every place. Like, you know, oh, yeah, you know yeah. what house is the parking house. Yeah. You know what house is the drug house. You know what house are the 
regular decent people houses. Mm. So, I mean, they're going to know that their kids are going there to a fellow who's spending his day playing dance music and talking about the gods. and Absolutely. Things like that, you know? Yeah. And did she play the movie for the kid? That's what I want to know. Why? You know, she said play a scary movie for him. Then he turned up at half ten dressed as ghost faced and chased away the kid around the apartment. Did she actually then watch the movie first? Is she like, oh, I didn't realize this is what he was going to do after I left him watch the movie, the bastard. Yeah, he once he told us to play a scary film on a video and let my son watch it. Oh. I'd be like, you're a weird fucker. No, I hope Sounds no. like she played a game of Simon Says with him. Weird. I don't know. Again, though, not a whole pile on this. I mm-hmm. thought, especially with the ending with the guy dying in a car crash, that you'd find more articles on it, but no. Fuck no, all, really. There. So this next one is a big enough one. I will call it our semi-main event because we have one more story after this and it takes place in Atlanta. That is the closest to the real deal in terms of MO and how things all play out. But before we go to Atlanta, we're going to talk about a bit of a false start. This is the case of the murder of Cassie Jo Stoddart. And I say it's a bit of a false start because these two dickheads had much grander plans in mind for their serial killer careers. They had a kill list and were prepared to play out the whole ghost face fantasy starting with poor Cassie. I'm going to get Amy to read out the Wikipedia information on this case and I'm going to interrupt as we go through it with extra information and insights into the whole thing from the research I did watching prison interviews with Brian Draper and from the home videos the two made running up to the murder. You can actually find this video on YouTube. It's about 20 minutes long. Um, You see him talking about why they're doing it and it seems that they're doing it for fame. They want to be... I don't know. I, I, I suppose they want to be like they're into horror movies. They love the stab franchise. They want to be like those killers. It looked like they did it for me, the thrill. Which it kind of confuses me, to be honest with you. Why would you want to be like the people from Stab? They always die. All the killers always die. At least some of them though, are invincible, like fucking Jason Voorhees or something, where you can come back yeah, <laughs> again and again and again. Sense. These people die and they're forgotten about. Dead. Nobody gives a shit. Unless you're the first one, no one really cares, you know? <laughs> I mean, not many people talk about Mickey Altieri outside of us. That's true. Okay. <laughs> you know? Name the third one. <laughs> so, on September 22nd, 2006, Cassie Jo Stoddard, an American high school student, was murdered by her classmates, Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik, both 16, in the, her aunt and uncle's house in, po- in Pocatello, Idaho, United States. Stoddart's body was discovered two days later when her relatives returned home from their trip. The perpetrators claimed that they were inspired to murder Stoddart by the slasher film Stab, which led them to be nicknamed the Stab Killers. Adam Chick and Draper recorded documentary-style videos about how they were horror movie fans, especially Stab, and wanted to reenact a similar murder in real life. They started a death list of other potential victims the day of Stoddart's murder following their initial plan. They had planned to kill somebody else instead of her. Mm. Uh, they went to the person's house. So you see it in the video. They're talking about it. They're like, okay, we're going to go check out this house. We're going to break in, have a look around. Uh, if that doesn't work out, we know Cassie has a staying at her aunt and uncle's house alone. And they're like, and they keep bringing it up. It's like, and we know Cassie's like her friend, but you got to make sacrifices, dude. And it's like, you're a fucking dumb fuck yep. shithead. Um, again, I would say in this case, no, the two of them were definitely as bad as each other is in like I don't think anyone's innocent here yeah but uh, Adam Chick is definitely the quieter of the two and kind of would easily led like no 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 Draper will get frantic and he'd start talking he'd get excited mm. and you could see him speeding up when he was talking and then Adam Chick would just be like you know calm down stop just kind of chill out and yeah. then Draper would come back down a little bit but he definitely had kind of a uh, more composed, more composure, yeah. even though he's the fool that went in. Because they're in school, and they're in, like, what, what I must assume is, like, study hall or whatever. Yeah. And he's they have the camera down in front of him, and they're kind of whispering, so you can only barely hear what you're saying. And, uh, like, when a teacher comes over, Draper grabs his, his copy and puts it into his bag really quick, and he's like, shit, 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 shit. And uh, Adam Chick is just there with his hand on his head, or on his, his head in his hands, and he's like... Pure fucking stupid and obvious. Yeah, pure kid stuff. like, yeah. And they're like, oh, Jesus Christ, guys. But it was there as well when they were doing this video that they were like, um, some serial killers' families won't let them be made into movies. You know, won't give their likeness away. We were saying right now in this video, 
anyone that wants it, make a movie about us. No problem. Use our likeness. Use our name. Go all out and all this kind of shit, you know? What a way to guarantee it. Not gonna happen oh, because they're not going to do it. Once they see you want it, they're definitely no. not going to do it. There's a reason why there hasn't been more BTK movies. There's a few low budget ones, but there's a reason why there hasn't been a bunch of them mm. because it would stroke that man's ego too much to make a big budget yeah, movie about them. When you're dead, fucking what's his name again? Why have all Dennis Rader? Jesus no. Christ, that guy's in my mind so much. It's crazy that I forget his name for even a split second. Yep, it's the one case I can just never get out of my mind. You always link it back to BTK. Obsessed with it. Yep. It was the first one I was obsessed, obsessed with. Mm. Like stuck into and uh yeah it's just something about him that fucking mystifies me yeah hate him i know hate him hate him but i just i just find this whole jew life thing so oh, interesting that it's just it's something i can't get away would from. be interesting as in like how how he got away with it like it's i just yeah. love to I, like he's told everyone a million times that's the thing i've heard it all like but to have been a fly in the wall there and see what was going on and just be Definitely. Bizarre. So anyway, back to Cassie Draper. Or on the night of September 22nd, 2006, Stoddard was house-sitting for her aunt and uncle, Alison and Frank Contreras, on Whispering Cliffs Drive in northeast Bannock County. The Contreras family was out of town and had hired Stoddard to come and take care of their three cats and two dogs for the weekend. Stoddard was visiting that, it was visited that evening by her boyfriend, Matt Beckham, who arrived around 6 p.m. Later, classmates Brian Draper and Tori Adamchick, who were both age 16 at the time, came over to the house to hang out. Stoddard gave the friends a tour of the house, including the basement. The four teens went into the living room to watch the film Kill Bill Volume 2, but Adamchick and Draper ended up leaving before the film ended, saying that they wanted to watch a movie at their local theatre instead. Stoddard and Beckham stayed behind. It's strange. I wonder why they would tell them that. Because that was their... um alibi for the police they said they went to see the movie pulse but neither mm. of them knew the plot line to it so i uh, just strange they would tell them this not that uh, we're just going home what if you know, they were thinking about survived? going to somebody else yeah well, that's it what if what, oh, what if yeah, they were thinking about going to somebody else so then they'd have somebody oh yeah they told us that they were going to the theater maybe there's a possibility you know, you know, i can't remember like... if they're talking about it but they do know that she's alone beforehand so mm. i would assume because you do see in the video it's like they're talking about that they're going to go do it Mm. there's a little bit of a time jump where they went and broke into the other person's house then they come back and it's like oh we're going to go to Cassie's house and there's like a, a t- you see the time jump on the time stamp for the video so recorder. chronologically they would have went to Cassie's house then to the other person's house to break in see nobody was there and, and then, then back to that they could go back here so they were him. probably going to use her as an alibi Cassie wasn't their up. first choice yeah. because I don't think they wanted to kill her I think yeah. they wanted to kill this person and she was just a convenient victim for them because yeah. she was alone in a house you know where she might and be familiar with them, like, and you know yeah, so yeah. yeah Stoddard was unaware that before the boys left Draper had unlocked the basement door so that he and Adam Chick could re-enter the house undetected sometime after leaving the house on Whispering Cliffs Draper and Adam Chick returned to the neighbourhood parked down the street got out of their car and put on costumes consisting of dark clothing gloves and white painted masks the boys quietly entered the house through the basement door while the other couple was watching television in the living room. They intentionally made loud noises in an unsuccessful attempt to lure Beckham and Stoddard downstairs so they could scare them. Next, they found the circuit breaker and turned off the power in the house, hoping the pair would come downstairs to check the breaker. When Beckham and Stoddard did not come downstairs, the boys turned some of the lights back on. Stoddard became uneasy after the temporary power outage and Beckham noticed that one of the Contreras' dogs kept staring down the basement stairs, periodically barking or growling. Seeing that Stoddard felt scared, Beckham called his mother to ask if he could stay the night at the house with her to ease her mind, but she denied his request. Instead, she offered to let Stoddard come home with Beckham and stay at their house for the night and she would bring Stoddard back to whisp- to. to- to Whispering Cliffs. To Whispering Cliffs house <laughs> the next morning. However, Stoddard felt it was her responsibility to stay at the house as she was hired to do and care for the animals and declined the offer from Beckham's mother. She seems really sensible. But I, she seems not really. Like, not, not really sensible. Like, like, the, the pets would have been fine for reliable, the night. Reliable, maybe, is what I mean. Yeah, like the pets would have probably been okay for the night. Like, do you know what are they going to do? They're going to go to sleep. You just put them where they were supposed to be for the night. And then you go away for the night and come back. Yeah. I mean, if you're 
aunt and uncle come back and you're that age, I'm sure you can say, look, your power will go in and out all night. I got scared. I left. For I don't think I'd have been allowed to pet sit. I'd have been allowed to babysit. There's other human beings in the house with me, but I don't think I'd have been allowed to like, oh yeah, just go over there and watch the dogs and stay out by yourself at that age. Yeah, especially in America. Yeah, no, no it wouldn't have happened. No. <laughs> At approximately 10.30 p.m., Beckham's mother picked him up, leaving Stoddard at the house alone. I wouldn't have felt right about it being Beckham's mom. No. Beckham called Adam Chick's cell phone to see where he and Draper were, possibly to meet up with them later. Beckham said he could barely hear Adam Chick, who was whispering on the phone, and assumed the boys were in a movie theater. Do you know what I would have done in that position as a parent? Honestly. Stayed. If, if, not even just stayed. I would have... If I pick one of the boys up and they're like, my girlfriend's inside there and she's feeling a bit scared. Uh, you mm. know, we heard noises and the, the electricity was going on and off. First, my reaction would be, hey, let Promise. me have a quick look at the electricity for you. So, you know, I'll oh, come yeah. in, show me where the, the circuit breaker. I'll have a look at it, see if I can see what's wrong with it. And the second reaction would be, and then that would let me see how the girl is. And once I'm in there, it would be like, right, what's her parents' number? I'm going to ring them and tell them they need to ring this girl. She's there on her own and she's not very fucking comfortable. She won't come with me. The smart yeah. thing here to do is ring one of us. So, you know, ring her That's parents true, yeah. and say, look, yeah. the, the, the electricity is dodgy here. She's freaked out. You know, it, yeah, it's kind of, again, bad parenting. There's a lot of bad parenting in this episode. Definitely. From the basement, Draper and Adam Chick heard Beckham leave. The teens turned the lights out again at the circuit breaker and waited, hoping Stoddard would come downstairs to turn the lights back on. She did not. Eventually, the boys went upstairs. Draper was armed with a dagger-type weapon and Adam Chick had a hunting knife, the weapons having been purchased at a pawn shop. Draper opened and slammed a closet door at the top of the stairs to scare Stoddard, who was lying on the couch in the living room. The boys then brutally attacked her, stabbing her approximately 30 times. 12 wounds were potentially fatal. During the investigation of the murder, police found that Draper and Adam Chick had recorded their plan to murder Stoddard in advance on videotape while they were at school. This video footage was shown at their trials. The boyfriend of Stoddard's mother was initially considered a person of interest after his fingerprints were found on the circuit breaker in the basement where the lights were being tampered with in the lead up to the murder. However, he provided a reasonable explanation to this discovery as he had previously done electrical work at the Contreras residence a few months prior to the murder, which was corroborated by the Contreras family. The attention turned to Stoddard's boyfriend, Matt Beckham, who had been the last known individual to see Stoddard alive. This is when he confirmed to the police that the lights had been flickering on and off while he was present at the home. His mother explained to police that she had heard Stoddard's voice from the house as Beckham came out the door. After he was cleared by a polygraph test and consistent alibi, detectives brought in Draper and Adam Chick for further questioning. Draper and Adam Chick told police that once they left the Whispering Cliffs residence, they went downtown to watch the movie Pulse. After the teens couldn't recount any details from the movie, the, te the detectives pressed harder to determine their whereabouts. They then claimed that they had instead gone through cars in the area and in fact not been seeing the film. Draper eventually confessed to police but downplayed his role in the crime. Draper and Adam Chick were arrested on September 27, 2006 and charged with first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. During the interrogations, each teen blamed the other. Draper claimed he was in the same room with Adam Chick when Stoddard was killed, but denied stabbing her, then later admitted to stabbing her under alleged commands from Adam Chick. He led investigators to Black Rock Canyon, where the teens had partially burned and then buried the clothing, masks and weapons they had used for the murder. This is where police recovered a partially burned Sony VHS tape, which after restoration showed video footage of their plans to kill Stoddard. All right, uh, I'm going to stop you there for just two seconds. Two. I looked up Pulse because I've oh, been talking about it myself and you for a while. And never oh, looked up to see what the somebody's in it. it. This, uh, this is a Wes Craven Not movie. Good, oh, yeah. I knew it. Yep. Wes Craven. Produced, written? Written. Produced, written. Co write, written. Yeah. But yeah, Wes Craven. When their computer hacker friend accidentally challenged a mysterious wireless signal, a group of coils rallied to stop a terrifying evil from taking over the world. Yep. Kristen Bell is in it. I knew it was somebody I knew, Kristen Bell, but I knew it was Res Craven as well. Uh, I was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fuck's sake. And I didn't even know the plot line. I mean, you like the director, but and you, you're going to use his you think other You'd have movie. like a production meeting and get all everything right first. You use like, two of these movies like... as inspiration, three of these movies as inspiration, and then you fuck off over here and you go to another one of these movies but don't know nothing about it and use that as your alibi. Idiots. Ridiculous. Idiots. Every time I look further into these two, the more I am just. 
mystified by their stupidity. <laughs> At trial, the prosecution revealed that Draper had said he was inspired by Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, who committed the Columbine High School massacre. Later, Adam Chick was said to have been inspired by the Stab horror film franchise. Draper was convicted on April 17th, 2007. Adam Chick was convicted on June 8th, 2007. On August 21st, 2007, based on being convicted of first-degree murder, each received a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, plus 30 years to life for being convicted of conspiracy to commit murder. Seems yeah. fair. That's a long time for a 60. We were talking about, sorry, and I know you pointed out it's like it's violence against women and all this stuff, but mm. I said, like, these, we were talking about this on Real Monsters this week. Yes. And I said, like, realistically, these guys would have done it to a guy or a girl. That was kind of irrelevant. But, yeah, they, they targeted the girl because that's what they thought good, the ghost face filler, killer usually does. And that is what's happened time and time again in all these cases. They, they, the first, one of the first is usually a female. No, you know, in all cases, it's been a couple. Billy and Stu killed Steve, Art, and Casey Becker. Nancy and Mickey killed the couple at the cinema. Um, third guy. See, mm. no one remembers the third guy. Oh, fuck. What's his name again? Jesus Christ. Roman <gasps> Bridger. Roman Bridger killed Cotton and his girlfriend. Who yeah. I'm sorry, I can't think of her name right now. Um, the fourth case was two girls. Not a, mm. a couple, but two girls together. In the fifth case, it was. I know. I yeah, I was wondering going to come across well, that. Well, we know, haven't yeah, talked yeah. about that. In the ones we've covered, it's always been a couple that they've hit first. So it, realistically, there's two some going I for the, the, pick it the girl first is bullshit. But um, do you know what I was wondering the most? Of? Because I did watch. I watched documentaries and I listened to Brian Draper talk about this whole yeah. thing. And in the sense of being a teenager... And get, because I've gotten swept up in movies before, not so much in these kind of movies, but you see like someone you want to emulate, especially at that age, that you right. want to be like the cool guy in the movies, you know, and you start buying clothes like them and you start using their catchphrases and stuff like that. Because as a teenager, you're trying to find yourself and stuff like that. Yeah. Did these two idolize the Billy and Stu from Stab, Luke fucking Wilson and, and whoever, uh, whoever else was in it, <laughs> those guys? Um, not the serial killer, but the actors and their part playing the parts. And was it like this case of once they'd done it, the the, the only way I could describe it is you know when you get really really drunk and you do something stupid and then you wake up in the morning and you're like that don't, instant don't, feeling. I can feel that feeling. Do you know that now? instant I don't like sinking it. feeling yeah, when you open your eyes? Gosh, sure. And I'm just wondering, is that the case of like you know as soon as the high wore off, did they get this instant sinking feeling of oh shit, this is real? Probably. And this is the rest of our life. Do you know? I'm sure if they didn't get it in straight away, they got it when they heard that sound of the door closed <laughs> well, behind them. Well, see you later, guys. <laughs> yeah, know? that was it. <laughs> it hit you real fucking fast then. Don't, I can't bear the thought of that. Like, even when you see someone like, you know, like an anti-hero and they get uh, caught by, by by the cops on TV and we always say it, imagine that sinking feeling and you know what it's like. And it, 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 I like, don't stay angry at people who get who do stuff when they're drunk now anymore. Do you know, like I've had cases where depends like, what it is. Well, no, like if somebody starts acting up when they're drunk now, right, or acting the dick, my first thought is there's no point in roaring at this person. They're gonna wake up in the morning, and the minute they are, they're gonna be like, "Oh shit!" And they're gonna feel bad enough about it. There's no point in me getting thick about it, like you know. So even the next morning, it's like eh, what you said was out of order, but. I'm sure you're suffering for it right now. And I know you're suffering for it right now. Even if you deny it, I know inside you're like dying. Yep. <laughs> you know? So it's like, it's not worth giving you shit about. No. You know? But I imagine that's what this is like. Because Brian Draper just saw it. That's all he kept saying in his interview was, I made a mistake when I was 16. A big mistake. But I paying for it now for the rest of my life. And he's like, I don't know if I'm ever getting out of here. Like, you know? Well, and we dissect that video a bit more on Real Monsters and we kind of go into what he said and they, what they were saying was meant by what he said. Yeah. But the long and the short of it is they did something really dumb when they were 16 and they're never getting out of jail. Like, they're without the possibility of parole was on the end of both of theirs. And they're there a while now so far. And according to Brian Draper, that has not changed. They've appealed a few times okay. to try and get that part of it taken out. But, no. So, because I would say 
because we've discussed this when we're talking about real monsters, and I think it is a terrible crime, and I think it should be a long, long time before they do see the light of day, but I think if you can't reform someone who is 16, getting them that young and reform them back to a point where they can come back into society or some level of society, then what hope is there for prison at all? What's the point in it? No, I understand what you mean, yeah. Animals, like, you know. I understand 100% what you mean, but I do think that there has to be a limit when, with crimes like that on how reintegrated you can be allowed to be in society. Again, I, like I said to you, it should be kind of steps. You have to go through certain steps to get there. Okay. You have to have, like I said to you when we were talking about it, you got to go to a psychiatrist, you got to go to counselling, you got to do all these bits and pieces, and we let you go out and work release bits and pieces like this as time goes on. But when you go to a psychiatrist, like you have to make a real breakthrough, a genuine breakthrough. They want to mm-hmm. see you in tears on the ground, realizing what you've done before you move on to the next step. And they're not letting you pass that next step until they get a genuine breakthrough, a genuine real breakthrough. So you have to put in the work, you know? And every step is forcing you to put in the work to get to that end goal of getting back out. And then once you're out, you are watched for life. Like you said, that's what I mean. Watched you're watched for life. For life. You know? Like you, you, you need to sign in. Like yeah, <laughs> it's in some life, way. Like, yeah. I mean, I know it sounds very 1984, but I think it should be sticking chips in people like that. To be honest with you, yes, you know? definitely, especially considering there we can is a girl you. that can come we back. We can disable like. you. We can put you on. No, again, I know oh, imagine just pressing like, a, bot- a button and they're disabled. Like and I know there's people looking, and I would agree. Like I, I, I again, play. I will say like when I'm spitting off views on this show. They're not necessarily what I believe. It's just thoughts. Literally me thinking out loud a lot of the time. And just kind of free free speaking. Because, I mean, I understand straight away. Like, when I really start thinking about something, I was like, that is a great idea for controlling, like, dangerous criminals. Problem is, there's also dangerous people who are in charge of the law. And those people are then in charge of these buttons to put down these other people. And they pick and choose who the terrible people are to get these these implants and mm. it's not always going to be bad. It's no. the same reason why I don't like the death penalty because you can't guarantee that the person that's getting the death penalty deserves the death penalty. They might be innocent. There might be a one in a million chance they're innocent. What if there is, there, is, there is concrete like DNA? Again, I would say something like BTK fine. Yeah. I think he only, he confessed because he, like I keep saying about this, I know we're back to him again, but I always say it's his retirement plan. When people are like saying that he was stupid in giving up the floppy disk, he knew what he was doing. He was well aware he would get tracked by that. He knew his time. He, what happened was he tried to make a comeback, mm. realized because he was, he was threatening to kill again at that point. Yeah. Realized he wasn't able to do it no more. And then he started up and yanky with the back and forth with the police. And it was at that point, it was like, right, I put in the effort. I am the BTK killer. No, I need to put a face to the crime so that I can get the, the 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 popularity of being that guy like you know yeah they'll make movies about me they'll write books about me and i mean even down to what he does now he makes journalists and anyone that wants to interview him fill out uh a form that he put together with questions he put together on it so he can decide whether you are if i worthy. saw that form the arrogance of it would make me not want to interview him and You're to be worthy. honest you know what we're getting for recording is a btk jar and every time you mention btk <laughs> you got to put like a tenor into it <laughs> for our holidays next year <laughs> Hey kids, can't get enough of that blood, guts and gore? Then head on over to our Patreon, where for just five bucks a month, you'll get exclusive access to our true crime show, Real Monsters, and horrific history tales from playing with bones with Amy Rose, along with early access to our mini-sodes and ad-free access to everything else. All this and loads more horror-tastic extras from the horrorverse. So what are you waiting for? Permission? Go nick your parents' card today and subscribe now at patreon.com forward slash it's a live alive pod. Remember, that's it's a live alive podcast a really really fake true crime horror podcast it's alive alive all the guts and gore with none of the guilt 
So the last case where we'll be covering today is probably the most popular and well-known Ghostface Massacre outside of the canonical Woodsboro crimes, and that is the 2019 Atlanta copycat killings. This one is kind of weird because it has this real-life soap opera thing going on around the main target and his family that acts as a motive for at least one of the perpetrators in these crimes. To explain all that, I need to give you a little background on the main target of this spree, Dion Elliott. Dion Elliott lived in Atlanta, Georgia with his mother, father, half-brother Jamal, and at one time his late twin brother Marcus. In 2019, after the murders of Tommy Jenkins and Avery Collins, two classmates of his, Dion began to get strange texts and calls insinuating that the recent slayings were related in some way to his past. As the messages continued along with more killings, Dion realized that the past events in question was that of his twin brother, Marcus. Yep. I remember us discussing covering this months ago. This is the one where Dion is dead and Marcus is Dion because Marcus felt that Dion would be missed more than him due to Dion being athletic and outgoing and Marcus being more uh, introverted and timid. In a nutshell, pretty much, but prepare to be confused because there's a lot of... Marcus is Dion, Dion is Marcus, Marcus is Dion, Dion, it gets fucking confusing. By the end of it, I don't know who's Dion, who's Marcus, it doesn't matter anymore. Would it help to have a pen and paper while you're listening to that? <laughs> they were out one Halloween when they were eight years old, trick-or-treating. The boys got separated temporarily when Dion stopped to talk to some friends, and by the time they were reunited, Marcus had had his candy stolen. Dion, although one age with his brother, acted as the older sibling in situations like this and chased the boy down to an old junkyard. The man who owned the junkyard was an old war veteran that the kids had nicknamed Hook Hand due to the hook he had in place of his hand. Seeing Dion run through his yard in pursuit of Marcus's candy thieves, he came out and let out a roar trying to scare away the kids. It's believed this tactic worked too well on Dion, who seemed to have hidden in the trunk of an old scrap car, gotten stuck and suffocated. Now, these were identical twin brothers and they shared everything. So much so that halfway through trick-or-treating, they swapped costumes, something his mother was unaware of. So when Marcus came home in Dion's costume and in a state of silent shock, she just assumed it was Dion who came home and that Marcus was the missing twin. Marcus stayed silent for days after as the scrapyard was searched for signs of, well, him. Eventually, Dion was found dead, but again under the assumed name of Marcus. Deciding that the loss of Dion would be too much for his family and uh, custom made to play the role, Marcus decided to leave himself dead and took on the life and persona of his now dead brother. Now, assuming Marcus could keep his story straight and take his identity to the grave with him, which he seemed to be doing for a long time with the greatest of ease before the killing spree started, then there should have been no one alive that could know his secret, right? I mean, he looks like Dion, sounds like Dion, worked hard so he could be the the athlete Dion was destined to be. I mean, it was foolproof. Mm. Only thing he didn't account for and really couldn't have prepared for was that his father, a trucker by profession, had a secret family hidden away on the road. This is where his half-brother Jamal comes into it. The boy's father, Earl, had hoped to keep the families mostly separate, but after Jamal's mother suddenly passed away, Earl had to fess up and bring Jamal to live with the rest of the family. What a thing to try and turn around and explain to your wife. <laughs> but I'm being decent and I'm taking care of the kids. <laughs> so you still love me, right? <laughs> and technically, Jamal's older than Deanna Marcus, so who's the mistress here? <laughs> no, but he had been keeping the second family. Oh, wasn't yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, 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 right, right, bad, yeah. bad, 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 bad. She seemed to get over because they stayed together. Um, anyway, Women. you. Sh- the question you really should be asking here is why does Jamal know? Yeah, how did he twig that? So apparently, what happened was Jamal was a big football guy. Obviously, Dion was a big football guy, and he was close with his father. He went out on the road with his father one time. Yeah. And his father bought him to meet his other family and introduced him to Jamal uh, under the kind of thing of, you need to keep this one quiet, right? So uh, Dion obviously, go, the, the both brothers seem to be very good at keeping secrets because Dion kept this a secret okay. and nobody knew, not even Marcus knew that he had met the other family. Is that and unusual for twins? Yeah, I would assume yeah. it is. I mean, especially these guys who seem like they shared everything. Like I yeah. said, they swapped costumes. That's how they, they got confused. Yeah. So... Yeah, so Jamal knew. So when Jamal came to live with the family and walked in to think he was meeting Dion with Marcus dead and saluted Ma- uh, Dion to 
a quizzed looking the yeah, looking back at him, you know, like who the fuck are you? I don't know you. That's uh, and Jamal was like, Well, you should. You know, we've met before, we've had conversations, we're buddies, why why aren't you? I'd have probably just me? thought too many knocks to the head after the American football. Well, he twigged it and he put it together and he for some reason was extremely pissed off about this. He I suppose he didn't understand why. Max has done what he did. Well, I think the reason is not a tiny bit strange. I can nearly see it if you're in that. But I mean, he saw it more as Dion was, or Max was stealing Dion's life. Like Marcus wasn't as good as Dion, and when he saw that Mar- Dion was dead, he decided to steal the life rather than assume it to protect his family. No, I think it was in the his heart was in the right place. Huh? It was his heart? I think. Oh, Marcus's heart, heart was in, was in the, the right, right place. place. Yeah, 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 he just kind of fell in line with it, but. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, Jamal, for a time, he was having these kind of uh, silly kind of fantasy where he kind of talk about, oh, if I could get him and all this kind of stuff. Eventually, he was into tattoo and he went to get tattooed and he met this new tattoo artist who had just come into town. And she, uh, actually very young to be a tattoo artist. She was only like 17. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I know this because she is the other killer in this situation. Again, we got a double. Oh. And this is Beth Wigham. And um, Beth was, her parents owned a mortuary, full on got girl. Yeah. And she was a tattoo artist in her spare time. Okay. I wouldn't be letting no 17 year old next or near me with a needle for a tattoo. No. Not even if you're a hot got girl. Not happening. I think she practiced <laughs> on the dead people in the mortuary. Oh, maybe. It's a maybe possibility. I never thought of that. Okay. Um, anyway, she was the movie fan. Let's put it that way. In, in mm. this pair. She was the Stu. She was the Mickey. She was the Richie. She loved Stab. Mm-hmm. She wanted to. She had, She always had a fan. She was going to do this with or without Jamal. Okay. And this is proven here later because this is one of the few cases where the killers fall out and end up continuing to do their own thing separately. Okay. And she kind of she seduced him which wasn't very hard apparently and they hooked up and she plied him with the plan of this is what we should do to get back at him fuck him we're going to take him out we're going to get him and all his friends okay um first she was no obviously he had one or two friends around that she was going to get and then she needed a bigger victim pool she was actually in school with Dion with marcus we're going to stick with Dion. He's calling himself Dion. So he knows, she knows them. She so knows she them knows like. Dion as it is. So she gets in there and she gets into detention with him. And she decides at this point, this is the victim pool. This is exactly like a movie would go. There's whatever, six of us here. And the killer is called. And she was, you know, getting Jamal to call while she was there so that she could see the impact of it and she could enjoy it. But she was playing the the, the movie. Nerd. She was playing the Randy type character in this situation. She was the movie nerd who knew all the rules. Okay. But really, at the same time, she was pulling all the strings. Yeah. Because even down to Jamal, she was pulling the strings. Something that would eventually, I suppose, split them up a bit. Now, what's interesting here, like I said, was while we have the similar dynamic to the Woodsboro killers, where one is generally leading the other along, and the means and motives are generally similar in one seeking revenge and the other doing it for kicks, this is actually one of the only instances in ghostface crime history where the killers only worked together a handful of times before they fell out and began to work independently to one another. Apparently, even after falling out when Jamal was on his deathbed, he wouldn't give up Beth. He hated her because she, he suspected she was using him as a patsy, but he hated Marcus more and preferred dying knowing that another killer was out there to finish the job he started. Now, this is where they managed to really... The one good thing about them splitting off and doing things separately was what the older killers had tried to do of misdirection by, oh, you have one of us in jail, but the other in a ring. Mm. Uh, worked better in this situation because they were never together. They were never around each other. They didn't not really like each other. They weren't helping each other. Mm. So when one killed and the other one happened to be there, really looking because he was, they, they, Jamal was there and she struck. Jamal yeah. was shocked to see her too. Yeah. So, you know, they, they, they would be able to act it out. Yeah. Now, Jamal eventually became the main suspect for Dion because he found the costume in, his, in the boot of his car. Mm, okay. These costumes were being given out um, to everybody at this uh, rave that the kids were pulling. And it was actually turns out that Jamal was the organizer of the rave. And he was say he was claiming that there was someone over him that supplied him that had this kind of secret, like this kind of Banksy of fucking 
raves. Raves. Yeah. And he had supplied him with this because it was going to be themed on the ghost face mm. mask. But it was actually him running the whole thing. He was the person who was behind this moniker. It's like a movie. Kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy, right? So he eventually got tracked down by Dion and they got, uh, you know, there was a bit of a struggle and he ended up, it was kill or be killed for Dion at that point. Mm. And Jamal got it and he refused to give up his source, but he did say there was another person pulling the strings as well. Okay. Uh, not long after he passed, Beth was also killed by Kim Palmer while she was attempting to murder Marcus Dion and his new love interest, Liv Reynolds. Uh, out of the six at detention that day, there were only three to survive with Beth dying, as stated above, but not before she murdered Manny Sanchez, who she locked in a car and burned alive, and Amir Ayub, 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 I don't know, it's a foreign one that I can't pronounce, Amir, <laughs> Amir, um, and Beth, that, that was a fucked up one, because apparently witnesses said that she had been seducing Amir, who was a bit of a nerd, as I said, mm. computer geek, a bit timid. And she had been kind of leading him along the whole time. And he was found in her parents' morgue, literally cut in half. Jesus. It looks like she attached some sort of a blade or, or chainsaw kind of thing to a lift they had there. And then he was in the lift and it just saw him right in half. And was this like a progressive thing? Like, did she start on like, do you know, like the dead bodies? Like, like, like uh, do you know, like where, where did this interest, did the interest Her come from? Her parents, the oh, like, I remember now this is a morgue. The bodies yeah. that come in are going out just as quick or being cremated just as quick. So evidence is being burnt up there, you know. That's so true. and her oh, parents yeah, aren't exactly well, yeah, going to hand that out willingly, that. you know. Yeah. They weren't exactly happy about this. And needless to say, after she was outed as a killer, their um, mortuary business went under. Well, I would imagine so. <laughs> yeah, even though she was dead at that point, and I think she was actually the last person to go through that mortuary. Altogether, the Atlanta copycat murder, copycats murdered eight people along with Manny and Amir. There was the two mentioned at the start, Tommy Jenkins, who was the kid who stole Marcus's candy the night Dion died. So that was why he was chosen. Oh. He was found stabbed dead in his car and Avery Collins uh, was chosen by Beth to be the opening hot girl kill, which was popularized by Star the Stab franchise as Avery used to give the gothic Beth a bit of a hard time. Uh, also, there was Leviticus, Le Leviticus <laughs> Jones. Latavius. 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 Jesus Christ. That's Leviticus. <laughs> no, I, mean, I knew there was no C, so I was getting rid of the C, so Latavius. I said Leviticus or something like that. Oh, that's uh, cool. Levi Let Say it again. Latavius. Latavius Jones, a neighbor of Kim Palmer. He was killed outside her ho house in what was believed to be an intimidation tactic against Kim, trying to get her scared. I assume Bet wanted to see some of the hysteria in her new social circle before she did away mm. with him. Uh, Shane O'Brien was a local dealer who supplied Bet with pot. He was found with a big syringe sticking out of his eye, also stabbed multiple times. Nice. Luther Thompson was stabbed and thrown from a balcony at, a, at the rave they were at, last seen talking to Beth before he went overboard. And last was Officer Barry Westbrook. He was stabbed in the head while in the line of duty. So, you might be asking at this point, if you're in that position, which we always say, well, no, in the Woodsboro case, they always get on to the cops. But in this mm. case, why were the cops not being brought into it? I think Dion has come out since he's still going by Dion, which is weird after they found out that he was marcus yeah uh but he basically said at the time it was kind of a thing of he was told his friends would die if he went to the cops that usually the killer was close to his friends it was also the kind of fear of being outed as marcus because he thought maybe he had done something you know, illegal there and yeah. getting big pro and, it, and he was afraid of how it would impact his mother okay he was very close to his mother. He obviously worried about her since the death of himself. Mm. <laughs> That's so weird. Imagine going to your own funeral. Like. <laughs> and um, he was just worried about that. And he said the whole hysteria thing. He says when you're under that kind of pressure, you don't really know what you're going to mm. do. And you have this kind of person who is taunting you by text, taunting you by phone. Seems like they have control over your phone and over everything that's going on around you. Like, you know, because they're setting you up into these kind of traps the whole time. Mm. He said, you just don't know what to do. You don't know how to think. You don't know how to act. So you're just going on instinct and just trying to follow the rules and, and get through it. Uh, he got on all right, though. He's, you know, now living a happy life. He went off to play football in university. He didn't go to the NFL, but he played in university for he a while. He played a bit of football. And him and Liv are still together. Good. Um, even though a lot of people said that at the time, they really thought Liv was one of the killers because she was a bit cuckoo. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Look, they seem to be happy. So. So that's it. That's all of them for now. Um, But the curse of the Ghostface Killer continues. And while we're done for today, you know we'll be back for at least one or two more of these stories in the future. Well, that's all we got for today. Now, we have a little update to our schedule and a little clarification to do. I might have mis-described this last week. I I didn't understand the, 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 the assignment. (laughs) <laughs> um, so now across the board we got something every day Monday to Friday mini monsters aren't gone they've mm. been moved they're not here on this profile anymore they're on our Patreon profile but they are free still 100% free they all go up on a Monday now if you're, and you don't have to worry about going onto our Patreon app to get to Patreon and making a big account or anything like that if you're on Spotify look at this episode then look up and there's a banner right over there and you just Click on that banner, it brings you right over to our Patreon where you will find free stuff. Because it's not all paid stuff over there. At this point, no, it's half and half. Mm. There's 16 episodes of Real Monsters free up there. They will become free over time, but I think it'll be batches of them will become free after a few months. So yeah. it could be a few months' time and we'll be like, okay, release another few, release another few, release another few. So Monday on Patreon, you're going to have four episodes of Mini Monsters dropping. Tuesday, you'll have real monsters dropping. Wednesday, it's Alive Alive. Thursday is going to be rather playing with bones or wrestling with my missus. They will obviously be switching back and forth six weeks on, six weeks off. Yeah. And then on Friday, we got the Horrorverse headlines. And then on the weekend, we're chilling the fuck out, right? Yeah, so exactly. leave us alone. Don't talk to us. <laughs> but that's the way it is. If you want to hear all the paid content on there, which is ad-free versions of this show, it is Real Monsters as they come out. And it is our new shows, Wrestling With uh, My Missus and Playing With Bones. It is five bucks a month, and the first seven days are free, so you can go check that out now. Um, and we'll be back next Wednesday with more tales from the Horrorverse. It's a live live podcast, all the guts and gore with none of the guilt. See you all next time, same live live time, same Horrorverse channel. Okay, love you, bye bye. Really love you, bye bye.